Each week, Damian Farrell from Damian Farrell Design Group takes a look at design issues. We've been talking a lot about Michigan as a state of design. We have. All the great people and work that mm -hmm. uh, has been done here in our state. It is phenomenal to learn about the process of architects and uh, also designers and the... Painters, sculptors. Exactly, the impact. Car designers, right. product designers, yeah. Here yeah. in Michigan, our guest today is from Eastern Michigan University. She's the former dean of the graduate school and currently professor of undergraduate program coordinator of interior design, Dr. Deb Delasky smith You've been at EMU for how many years now? Oh, I hate to admit it, but 35. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say that I, you know, was a baby when I started, but that would be <laughs> a lie. <laughs> uh, but yes, I came as an um, instructor and stayed and stayed and stayed and enjoyed a variety of opportunities and then spent 14 years at the graduate school. And this past fall, I'm now back at the um, department teaching in the program, teaching undergraduate and graduate courses in interior design. How vast are these courses in the program in interior design? I wonder if people even know there's an interior design school at Eastern Michigan University, the general public, that is. Well, maybe they don't, but we've been around since the 70s, actually, and accredited since the mid-80s um, with the fighter accreditation, which actually changed its name in the uh, 90s to CIDR, um, Council for Interior Design. And uh, we are up for reaccreditation this coming April, so we've just learned of okay. the dates of the site visit. So all right. oh. well, good we're luck with that. Excited we'll about well. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's where we haul all the projects out mm -hmm. and, and show the the scope of work. So it's a four year program, undergraduate program, and then we do offer a graduate opportunity for students. And even some who choose to go on for a doctoral program, mm -hmm. uh, the College of Technology where we're housed has a central doctoral program that one of the emphasis areas can be interior design. Mm -hmm. So we work with them at all levels. Your dissertation, I wanted to read the title of this. Oh dear. Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And it's something yeah. that is impacting so many people in yes. our baby boom it's generation. Nice. Yeah. Caregiver characteristics contributing to person environment fit for older stroke survivors, a qualitative exploratory study. And you did this when? When did that come out? Well, I finished my doctoral work in 89, so okay. this was work that preceded that for a few years. It was a study, a collaborative study, and it was funded by, the, by AARP. And we looked at not only the family issues, the housing issues, the nutrition issues, the nursing issues, so um, even clothing issues. So it was a real mm -hmm. collaborative yeah. opportunity and research project from all of us. I looked at the housing piece, but also looked at the fact that many of these individuals were the strokes. The stroke survivors themselves were all over 65, and also their caregivers. Many of them were over 65. Many of them were in their 70s and 80s, and most of their homes just weren't accommodating the fact that the person who suffered the stroke had issues with using the environment, but even more importantly, the caregivers had a lot of issues helping the stroke survivor. Just because of their age. Exactly, yeah. their age, or the home had stairs and they converted a dining room to a bedroom, or a variety of things that went on, but looking at the, the person environment fit and how poorly it was for many of these individuals who choose to remain in their own homes. <laughs> This is why I think, as we design homes today, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, I think all homes should take this into account. We yeah. all age, right? Yeah. Which is a concept of universal design that both architecture and interior design professions have been advocating for a long time. Absolutely. But I think what, what's important as well, just to put the, your thesis at a, in context time-wise, even in 89, our thinking wasn't terribly advanced about how to deal with senior environments or environments that are impacted by certain disabilities. Correct. And this was I early even, days. I even gave a presentation to the um, Housing Association okay. in 82 okay. dealing with topics of universal design. It wasn't called that back then, but the notion that people could age in place and age in place successfully because the doors were a little bit wider yeah. or the light switches were a little bit different or instead of doorknobs we have handles and a variety of other things 
simple things, but yet at the time, because they weren't mass produced, they were more expensive. So the Home Builders Association wasn't buying it mm -hmm. at that moment yeah. and said, because there wasn't a demand, why should we do that? Well, now we're starting to see a little bit more demand as the baby boomers are aging and yeah. are requesting yeah. it in the condos that they're purchasing or the new homes that they might be building for themselves. So, you know, it is a market trend, and the notion of universal design affects all persons with all abilities, and even the, the flexibility of environments for kids, as well as wheelchair users, as well as very, very healthy seniors who are living, you know, as wonderful centenarians. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What are your students coming up with in this game plan? Do they understand this? They're young. They haven't experienced this yet, how hard it is to get upstairs as you get older. <laughs> or uh, unless maybe they have a physical uh, disability that they're dealing with, just getting around in an infirmed type way. Well, I was, I was sharing with Damien that with both my graduate and my freshman this semester, I have them use wheelchairs. I have them go around our buildings here on campus, and some have been properly modified, and others have been patchwork quilt modified, if you will, because they're old buildings. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, we have them wearing greased up goggles so that it, it uh, simulates cataracts and the yellowing of the eye as you age. And in addition, they put stuff in their ears to modify their hearing and uh, also you know, are blindfolded and have to move around the environment and deal with the glare and a variety of things. So these are freshmen. In addition, we have them researching different conditions. So what does it mean to be diabetic? What does it mean to have MS or um, MD or a stroke or heart conditions? And granted, with all of these uh, issues, there's a continuum of abilities, you know, some mm. that live very, very healthy, active lives and require very limited accommodations and others that have severe conditions and um, require a lot of accommodations. So you learn about these conditions and many of them choose the condition to research because a family member or grandparent has it and they want to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So they give presentations on these topics and so here in my freshman class they're learning about disabilities, they're learning about environments for kids, they're learning about the full spectrum. They have a new perspective now. They do and we're hoping that it carries through their four years so that as they're interviewing clients, they're, they're thinking carefully about modifications that might be needed or flexible spaces that with time will accommodate them if they get worse. Can you give us an example of what you're talking about? What should we be, how should we be creating our homes in design, taking in these principles you've talked about? How about the carpet story? <laughs> 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 we were out front sharing a variety of stories. Um, I, I have a variety of them to, to uh, go into, but um, first of all, I just want to mention that we do very little residential design in our program. Most of it is commercial design. Okay. Um, but what residential design we do can also include facilities as one ages, like adult mm -hmm. foster care right. or uh, assisted living or independent living or a variety mm -hmm. of those. Um, specialty care units like for Alzheimer's and one example I was giving was the facility where the designer loved the pattern in the carpet and the color in the carpet and chose it and installed it and many persons with Alzheimer's or various forms of dementia um, tend to have a picking action where they're picking the flowers off the wallpaper, they're picking things off the carpet. If there's a loose thread, they'll have this picking behavior. That's very similar to um, children with autism as well. Right. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. So here was this carpet where if you squinted, it almost looked like worms or snakes were crawling oh. on the carpet. And after very little time of having this expensive carpet installed, they replaced it. Because, and in fact, they, they, I was consulting on that job, and I said, well, that was your biggest mistake. That was your first mistake. <laughs> that, you know, I could have told you that even before you installed it. And sure enough, they were just, they were afraid of the carpet. And here we think about older people in carpets. You just, the trip you factor. Just, I didn't yeah. think about the design yeah. factor. Yeah. In Very it. much so. <laughs> or the yeah. color factor. Yeah, the color. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was sharing another example of a facility down in Florida where my grandmother was. And my mother came home raving about how this decorator did a wonderful job. And so I went down there and I was standing at the main entrance counter waiting for my grandmother. And I was just observing some people over this one little gathering space. And there was, they did this. Uh, wallpaper that matched the sofa and the side chairs and then they had these colorful solid colored pillows on the sofa 
And I'm watching about five, six people go to sit down on this sofa. And what people don't realize is as the eye ages, things start to blend and blur, and they can't see where the edges of things are. All these people were aiming their butts at the <laughs> pillow, <laughs> sitting down, yanking the pillow out, and then, you know, when their friend came, they got up and left and left. They left the pillow, and the next person came, aimed for the pillow. The pillow. <laughs> Would have been a good advertising strategy for Target stores. That's right. right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, you know, those kinds of issues are issues that we try and teach from freshman year on. And to be sensitive to the fact that the eye ages in yellows. And as an interior designer, your client may not understand all of that. That's where Correct. you have to understand it to bring it to them when they're That's picking. That's where this education is so yeah. critical. Yeah. And, and not to debunk it in any way, but there is such a dramatic difference in because we're in the same profession, essentially, between decorating and interior design. In my, well, the interior design is about a consciousness, it's about a gaining of knowledge of how our environments affect us. Correct. It deals with acoustics, it deals with yeah. lightings, it deals with HVAC, it deals with building systems, it deals with you know, ergonomics Correct. and how the body deals with the macro and micro right. environment. Um, yeah deals with color, color theory, mm -hmm. fabric materials, their finishes, all those kinds of... Our program is eight studios that are sequenced fall and winter, and they have to follow that sequence. And the projects in the junior and senior year are typically real clients that we've brought in, whether it's a hotel project or a retail project or a healthcare project. We're using as much real life experience that we that we can get. Do you think we've come to a point now where these kinds of principles we talked about will be in every design in the future, not just for uh, adult foster or uh, nursing homes or whatever? That these are principles that should be in place everywhere. I think those facilities, and when you talk about making things better for other people to move around, it that, that's good for all of us. It absolutely yeah. is. It you know it, it, as I said, it, if you if you build a ramp and shout that this is the entrance for a disabled person, yeah. you know, it's pretty segregating and um, demeaning in mm -hmm. the sense that this is your only way of getting in and out, as opposed to a, a, a soft approach that is ramp efficient but not ramp like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's got landscape architect work around it that you're you're gradually entering this building and it it works for a mom with a stroller, it works with a delivery person in a hand cart, it works for a person using a wheelchair or someone using crutches. And it doesn't shout that this is a disabled entrance and this is where you need to be. Um, so to embed a lot of this into mm -hmm. everyday design, I think, is very important. So the notion of the pad toggle switch, where you don't have to have fine motor control to turn a light on and off, um, where you're using lever handles, where your elbow can be used as opposed to needing the ability to grip a knob and turn. Mm -hmm. Or a faucet or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of this incorporation is, is really important. Um, and it... And some products are still pretty expensive, but I think the more there's demand and the more they're manufactured, like anything else, you know, the very first calculator was horribly expensive and horribly big. Yes. <laughs> some of us, dollar, right? some yeah. of us remember that. <laughs> but you know, the more you make it, the more you manufacture it, the the better the price point, and the more people embed them and incorporate them into their everyday design. After all, it's very different from 1989 when you first had your dissertation. <laughs> Yeah. Right. about this very topic. Right. Great talking with you, Dr. Deb DeLasky-Smith. Some final thoughts from uh, Damian Farrell. Well, we, we were also joking before the show about things like, oh, that, that wonderful fresh smell of new carpet, that, <laughs> that smell of a, of a newly painted room, this, that, that wonderful smell of a new motor car. And so, and the awareness that's happened over the last number of years now. But what's that's, in those smells? That's poison, <laughs> people. Yeah, that's right. I know. It's <laughs> that is poison. not a well, good and that's, thing. That's a good example how interior design, it's not just sight, it's everything. Oh, it's, oh absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a much texture, broader, color, yeah. much broader context. The, the chemical yeah. composition of stuff has now become an important part of, of 
both architecture and, and, and interior design. Yeah. This right. is something we're really focusing on, how things are made, built, disposed of. Installed. Installed. Damien on design each week here on the Lucy Ann Lance Show. Our thanks to Dr. Deb Delansky-Smith, Professor of Undergraduate Program Coordinator for Interior Design Programs at Eastern Michigan University. And our thanks to Damien from Damien Farrell Design Group here in Ann Arbor. You're listening to Ann Arbor's Talk Station, 1290 WLBY.